Good afternoon. We continue with the Apollonian temperament. We encounter a special difficulty in attempting to put into words the nature of the Apollonians. Apollonians. The intuitive feeling NF types INFJ E N F J I N F P and E N F P were the others the Dionysian, Epimethean, and Promethean pursue ordinary goals. The goal of the Apollonian cannot be seen as other than extraordinary. Indeed, so extraordinary is his goal that not even the Apollonian himself can talk about it in a straightforward way. It defies his description. Carl Rogers, certainly one of the more able exponents of the Apollonian way, presents an excellent illustration of the torturous and convoluted rhetoric seemingly required. This is written by Carl Rogers on Becoming a Person, Boston, Houghton, Houghton Mifflin, 1961. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Becoming a person means that the individual moves towards being, knowing, and accepting. The process which he inwardly and actually is. He moves away from being what he is not, from being a facade. He is not trying to be more than he is with the attendant feelings of insecurity or bombastic defensiveness. He is not trying to be less than he is with the attendant feelings of guilt or self-depreciation. He is increasingly listening to the deepest recesses of his psychological and emotional being and finds himself increasingly willing to be with greater accuracy and depth that self which he most truly is. Although this passage is seen by other styles as at best speaking in riddles and at worst sheer nonsense, that same passage is revered by the NF as elegantly expressing, expressing the Apollonian way, the search for self. The purposes of SPs SJs and NTs are understood by SPs, SJs, and NTs alike, although they may not embrace them. The NT can understand the SP's desire to be free of responsibility, just as he can understand the SJ's satisfaction in its possession. So can the SP see the NT's desire to store up capabilities and the SJ's desire to store up commodities. Excuse me. He would be the last to look a gift horse in the mouth, for that matter, since these stores tend to be given out to those who need them. The SJ even admires the NT, his technical storehouse, and envies the SP, his generous and receiving nature. But here, the mutual understanding of purpose ends. None of these understand the aim of the NF, and in turn, the NF cannot really grasp the other's commitment to what seems to the NF to be false goals. For the NF pursues a strange end, a self-reflective end, which defies itself becoming while the SPs, SJs, and NTs can go after their goals straightway and at full throttle, the NFs search for self in circular and thus perpetual. How can one achieve a goal when that goal is to have a goal? The NF's truest self is the self in search of itself. Or in other words, his purpose in life is to have a purpose in life.
always becoming himself. The NF can never truly be himself, since the very act of reaching for the self immediately puts it out of reach. Hamlet wrestled with this same dilemma. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it be nobler in the heart to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take up arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them, an enterprise of great pith and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. The Apollonians' cross purposes have never been expressed better. To act, to achieve, to become, is to destroy one's being, while to be without acting is sham, and therefore non-being. One becomes oneself if and only if one does not. This paradox in the, is the NF's burden throughout life, and his job, quite apart from his goal, is to resolve the paradox. Most do, some do not. The ones that do are happy and productive, the ones that do not suffer. How can I become the kind of person I really am? Asks the NF. He hungers for self-actualization, to be and to become real, to be what he is meant to be, and to have an identity which is uniquely his. His endless search most often causes him guilt, believing that his real self is somehow less than it ought to be. And so he wanders, sometimes spiritually, sometimes psychologically, sometimes physically, seeking to satisfy his hunger for unity and uniqueness, to become self-actualized into a perfect whole and to have an identity which is perfectly unique, even though the path in search of self are never clearly marked. And then this is written by Hermit Hess, Siddhartha, New York, New Directions, Public Corporation, Publishing Corporation, 1951. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> But where was this self, this innermost? It was not flesh and bone. It was not thought or consciousness. That was what the wise men taught. Where then was it to press towards the self? Was there another way that was worth seeking? Nobody showed the way. Nobody knew it. Neither his father nor the teachers and the wise men, nor the holy songs. They knew a tremendous number of things, but was it worthwhile knowing all these things if they did not know the one important thing, the only important thing? To be a grain of sand lost on a beach with millions of other grains is to be nothing. To be lost in the crowd, to have the same meaning as others. To share a faceless identity is not to be at all. In order to make a difference and to maintain individuality, the unique contributions made by the NF in his roles as worker, friend, lover, parent, leader, son, daughter, homemaker, wife, husband, creator, must be recognized. No matter how the NF structures his time and relationships, he needs to have meaning. He wants their significance appreciated, or at the very least recognized as existing. Only through this kind of feedback does the NF know that he has unique identity. Self-realization for the NF means to have integrity, that is unity. There must be no facade, no mask, no pretense, no sham, no playing of roles. 
To have integrity is to be genuine, to communicate authentically, to be in harmony with the inner experiences of self, to be inauthentic, false, two-faced, phony, to be less than real is to lose self and live a life of bad faith, living a life of significance. Making a difference in the world does satisfy the NF's hunger for unique identity. It is no wonder that he experiences life as a drama, each encounter pregnant with significance. The NF can bring to each relationship a heightened sense of meaning, lending drama to the events in those relationships. NFs are extremely sensitive to subtleties and gestures and metaphoric behavior not always visible to other types. He is also vulnerable to adding dimensions to communications which are not always shared or perceived by others. The NF's relationship can fall into a pattern of enthusiastic anticipation accompanied by a considerable investment of effort and emotion, ending in a disappointment that what could have been was not the NF is seldom miserly. The NF is seldom miserly in the energy and time he is willing to devote to a relationship, especially as it is developing. A like return need not be the quid pro quo for the NF to continue investing generously as long as some response is forthcoming. Although these Apollonians make up only about 12% of the general population, or about 24 million people. Their influence on the minds of the populace is massive. For most writers come from this group, novelists, dramatists, television writers, playwrights, journalists, poets, and biographers are almost exclusively NFs. Technical and scientific writers tend to be NTs, but writers who wish to inspire and persuade, who produce literature, most often are NFs. The question which this group asks about the meaning of life, of their own lives and what is significant for humankind, saturate fictional literature. The theme of people in restless search of self runs through novel after novel, is voiced by protagonist after protagonist, and is the sort of agony in drama after drama. The search for meaning as a necessary pilgrimage for all people is advanced by the NFs in their writings. Very often the other types the SJs, NTs, and SPs are troubled by the thought that they ought to be pursuing these values, even if somehow the search for meaning and integrity does not beckon to them. This, this reluctance of 88% of the world to join the search for self-actualization is a great source of mystification to the NFs. As NFs well know, the pen is mightier than the sword, but the impact of the NF is not limited to the written word. NFs heavily populate the professions of psychiatry, clinical and counseling psychology, the ministry, and teaching. More than any other group, NFs can speak and write fluently, often with poetic flair, as members of the communication media, NFs may exhibit a sense of mission, using their creative efforts to win followers for their cause, whatever it may be. But through the NF, I'm sorry, but though the NF can get caught up in a cause, he may not stay involved for long if the cause fails to have deep, lasting, significance with opportunity to better the conditions of people in the world. For example, when the flower children movement was centered 
on the west coast in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district. It was joined by NFs, particularly NFPs, but it was chiefly populated by SPs. The NFs watched the SPs living in the moment, free of the past and future, and they wanted to experience this immediacy but it was inherent in them to need to pursue a larger significance, a more profound application. The movement only held them for a brief time, and they left, disenchanted. As fast as the NFs moved into the communes, they moved out to search elsewhere for self-actualization and ways to express their unique identities. More often than not, their search continued in the causes and movements which had gained popular recognition and, to some degree, acceptance. Robert Kirsch catches this characteristic in the founder, mentor, and guru of Gestalt therapy, Fritz Perls. He came into his own very late. At 32, he was still living with his mother. At 53, he had only begun to break with his own training. Not until his mid-60s, wandering through America, experimenting with LSD, denied the academic respectability he always sought. He did find that his life and the world were beginning to come into confluence. The time had come for his idea in California, young psychologists were impressed with his gifts as a therapist, his almost uncanny ability to read people. He would continue to wander to Kyoto to study Zen, to a lathe in Israel, until he came to Isaline. E-S-A-L-E-N, Isaline. He was not entirely happy there to begin with. At first, one of the many competing stars. He despised rivals, called Abraham Maslow a sugar-coated Nazi, and Rollo May an existentialist without an existence. It was as much his bent for mischief and excitement as it was any sound assessment. Perils was psychoanalyzed, bio-energeneticized, dionysized, Alexanderized, Rolfed, psychedelicized, experienced many of the roads to salvation offered in our times. He didn't find it. Perhaps it didn't exist. No forever after happiness for him. Life is a rose garden. The petals wilt and the thorns remain. It's from Robert Kirsch, from Fritz Perils, Mining the Gestalt of the Earth. L.A. Times calendar, March 23rd of 1975. Whether a guru of Esseline or a teacher in a more traditional setting, the profession of transmitting ideas and attitudes tends to attract NFs. Together, the SJs and the NFs make up the bulk of public school teaching facilities. Very few SPs or NTs staff the schools of the nations. If the NTs do go to into teaching, they gravitate towards higher education. The SPs as a group do not seem to find teaching at any level particularly attractive, although a small number may enjoy the excitement of elementary school teaching. SJs outnumber NFs in the teaching field. However, roughly three to two. As their subject matter, the NFs tend to choose the humanities and the social sciences as areas of interest. Just as teaching appeals to the NF as an occupation in which to find himself, so do other occupations which have this as their goal. Work toward, I'm sorry, work directed toward midwifing people into becoming kinder, warmer, and more loving human beings appeals to NFs. They tend to see potential good in everyone and often devote their lives to the cultivation of this potential. Both the ministry and missionary work understandably attract NFs, as did the Peace Corps. 
some NFs are willing to make great personal sacrifices to help others find their way. The NF can be ruthless in making this come out about for himself and for others. NFs as a group show little interest in buying and selling or any commercial occupations, nor do they find the physical sciences particularly attractive. They prefer to work with words and need and want to be directly or indirectly in communication with people. One of the ways they work well, one of the ways they work with people is through the interpretive arts. Where the SPs are drawn to the performing arts, the NFs are drawn to the arts which involve verbal and written communication. As actors and actresses, the NFs take on the character of the person being portrayed. When the SP would be playing himself dressed up in a costume, for example, John Wayne playing himself dressed as a cowboy, soldier, businessman, or lawyer, the NF's personality is submerged in his role. The SP actor remains himself and is never in danger of questioning his identity. The NF actor on and off stage can acquire a different identity with each role he plays. The NF has an extraordinary capability to appear to his beholder to be whatever the beholder wants to see and seldom does the NF find it necessary with his powers of empathy to, relive the to relieve the beholder of his illusions. Rather, the NF withholds his self-knowledge except with those he cares for deeply, that his general public sees him as other than he knows himself to be is a matter of internal amusement. The NF is willing to let be whatever appears to be if this is what the insignificant other seems to need to want, need and want. <clears throat> Here's another reading from Penelope Ash, Naked Come the Stranger, New York Dell Publishing Company, 1969. Jillian turned from the mirror. The mirror, after all, couldn't reflect the most essential attribute of them all. Jillian walked to the bar, made herself a pitcher of martinis, sat drinking, naked in the Eames chair, cold leather against skin. Nice. The major quality was something reactive, a chameleon quality that somehow enabled her to transform herself in the eyes of any man. She could become and she had felt the process often enough to know its validity. Pale of skin, full-breasted, intellectual, sexy, aloof. She could be whatever the man happened to be looking for at the moment. She could become any man's dream woman and somehow accomplish it without relinquishing her own identity. It was a process of becoming. It existed not in mechanical tricks, but in acute sensitivity. It took place not in her physical alterations, but in the eye of the beholder. That religion of the 60s, the encounter group movement, was largely motivated and populated by NFs, seeking greater intensity in their relationships, seeking an elusive intimacy. They searched in tea groups, sensitivity groups, gestalt groups, marathons, nude and otherwise, transcendental meditation groups, primal scream groups, all in an effort to find a way to give deeper meaning to their lives, to develop the ability to live more openly and honestly. They explored verbal and nonverbal dimensions of communication to become more fully aware of their emotions, hoping to reduce to a split second the delay between the occurrence of an emotion and its awareness in consciousness. In many, many groups they found, for a time, the sense of intimacy they sought 
describing the experience as an almost spiritual peak or rush. At the exact moment when I encounter someone, I feel as if I am someplace I have never been before. It's hard to describe. Like you and this other person are out in space with each other and looking down on the earth. Terry O'Banion and April O'Connell, a shared journey, Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey, Prentice Hall, Inc., 1970. Often though, after the group experience was over, the intimacy faded in the dulling routine of daily life, daily living. <laughs> Some of the disenchantment, which has been reported with the group experience, may stem from an unrealistic expectation of what that experience could deliver, especially on the part of the NF, who may not have come to terms with his characteristic of sensing himself as divided. Indeed, NFs report over and over that they are subject to an inner voice which urges them to be real authentic, meaningful. Always in the NF is the voice dialoguing about being whole, significant, and oneself. At once, audience and actor, the NF is caught in a split, in awareness. He is always on stage, and at the same time is watching himself being on stage. The irony of this consuming hunger for a sense of being oneself is that it condemns the NF to be ever split, standing to one side and watching himself be himself. I think you're too conscious of yourself all the time with everybody, she said to her sister. I hope at least I haven't a slave nature, said Hilda. But perhaps you have. Perhaps you are a slave to your own idea of yourself. Hilda drove in silence for some time after this piece of unheard of insolence from that chit Connie. At least I'm not a slave to somebody else's idea of me, and that somebody else a servant of my husband's, she retorted at last in crude anger. From D.H. Lawrence, Lady Chatterley's lover, New York, Batum Books, 1928 and 1968. Perhaps because the work of the NF needs to give significance as well as provide a service which would content an SJ, and because he needs work which matters to him and to others, often the NF has difficulty placing limits on the amount of time and energy he devotes to his work. Unlike the SP who can work on impulse, the NF works toward a vision of perfection, a perfect work of art, a perfect play, novel, film, a perfect relationship. And of course, once the work is done, once the creation is created, it never seems to live up to the magnificence of its conception. Nonetheless, NFs tend to be unwilling or unable to limit a commitment they make to a production once they become involved. At that point, they can be unreasonably demanding on both themselves and others around them. As for Kubrick, he is still working 18 hours a day overseeing the final fine tuning of the soundtrack. There is such a total sense of demoralization if you say you don't care. From start to finish on a film, the only limitations I observe are those imposed on me by the amount of money I have to spend and the amount of sleep I need. You either care or you don't, and I simply don't know where to draw the line between those two points. Kubrick's Grandest Gamble from Time, New York, December 15th of 1975. Although he is apt to be passionate in his pursuit of creative effort, the NF can be an intellectual butterfly, flitting from idea to idea. A dilettante In his pursuit of knowledge when compared to an NT, the NF wants to taste all the abundance of life, as does the SP. 
but always wants his experiences to have meaning beyond the mere event. NFs tend to romanticize their experiences, their lives, and the experiences and lives of others. And they are apt to be far more interested in people watching than in abstractions. As with the NT, the NF is future-oriented and focused on what might be. But rather than thinking about the possibilities of principles, as does the NT, the NF thinks about the possibilities in people. He enjoys bringing out the best in others and speaks often of actualizing the potential of others and of himself. As with his perception of himself, <clears throat> excuse me, so it is with the NF's perception of others. Whatever is, is never quite sufficient. The thought that the visible is all there is, is untenable for an NF. And the last page of this part. The Greeks, of course, hang on, <coughs> read about the Greeks a little bit. It's starting to sprinkle here. The Greeks, of course, caught the spirit of the NF in their mythology and one of the most fascinating and complex of all the gods. SP, Dionysus, reveled in the pleasures of the vine and body living fully in the here and now, responding to reality as he found it. He gave to man an understanding of enjoyment of the sensual. Epimetheus suffered all the evils of Pandora's box, but in his loyal SJ way, he stood by her as he shoulds and oughts, as his shoulds and oughts dictated, taking comfort in the one science hoping always that tomorrow must be better. Sorrowing, sorrowing that man was mere clay, N.T. Prometheus stole fire from the sun, brought it to man and paid a terrible price, but he gave man technology. Apollo in Greek mythology stands as a direct link between the gods and man, giving man a sense of mission, showing man how to continue in his search for the sacred, even though he has known the evil of the profane. Apollo was a self-appointed bearer of truth, and he undertook the task of interpreting for men the will of his father, Zeus. Apollo symbolizes the duality of the Hellenic spirit the urge to ideals, to truth, to beauty, to spirituality, and sacredness, and the accompanying desire to plumb the profane, the ugly, the corrupt, and the fleshly. He stood for the Grecian ideal of purity of spirit, a dedication to helping others, of the bringer of therapeutic music and song, he represented the healer of mind and body. He was the giver of prophecy, spokesman for the gods, the inspirer and the inspirational, the divine and the incorruptible, the primitive and violent side of Apollo only erupted when his supremacy was challenged or when he was frustrated in his efforts to bring peace and happiness to man. Within Apollo, the sense of mission, the cult of the individual, the search for identity existed side by side with untamed lust, the willingness to murder for a cause, the willingness to use priestesses in his rights, even at the expense of their sanity, and ultimately the betrayal of his father, Zeus. In Apollo, Side by side existed the sacred and the profane. In Apollo, the NFs find their prototype. Their hunger is not centered on things but people. They are not content with abstractions. They seek relationships. Their need does not ground to action. It vibrates with interaction. 
as the NF seeks self-actualization and identity and unity, he is aware that this is a lifelong process, an ideal toward being and becoming a final, finished self. All right, the next page will be page 67. We've been reading the four temperaments from the book, Please Understand Me, Character and Temperament Types by David Kiersey and Marilyn Bates. <sighs> Thank you for being with me. We're over here at the little dividing section between Pretty Water and Lake Sahoma. And it's bus time, so there's a lot of noise going by. I appreciate you being with me and listening. That's the end of that chapter. The next will be chapter three, mating and temperament. I appreciate you. Thanks for being with me.